so our next speaker is uh, Principal Solutions Architect with Pulse Secure, specializing in security and mobile solutions. She's worked in a variety of internet-related roles since 1994, and she's a really cool chick. Thank you, Dr. Elisa Lorenzen. Thanks. Good morning. So I have to admit, when I saw Dan's slide about distributed denial of service, I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> Hopefully, I still have something interesting to say. So there was a new star report that was done about a year ago that um, of the companies they polled, they found that about 60% of them had experienced a distributed denial of service attack within the past year. These problems are here, they're not gonna go away, they're only getting bigger, 300 gigabits bigger. But it helps to understand where they came from and then a little bit about why they happen. The tools that people use to execute them and then some of the mitigation strategies and also some of the social and cultural responses to these issues. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of that starting off with the history. So the first denial of service attacks were pretty simple. Ping dash F, anyone? <coughs> Flood attacks, throw enough data at something that it falls over. When the internet is small and your boxes are small and your pipes are small, this is actually not very hard to do with simple traffic like ping or UDP packets. Obviously, it's also pretty simple to defend against. It's not that hard to turn off ping. It's a little harder to turn off or to turn off allowing ping through the router that's hitting the web server. It's a little harder to turn off UDP. That's a little more important. But where it really starts to get interesting is when you, you know, you've got that mouse trap in place and the better mouse that comes along is SIM floods, TCP SIM floods. And SIM floods are the first evolution in denial of service where you go from just throwing packets at something as fast as you can to a slightly smarter approach where you're throwing SIM connect packets to start a TCP through a handshake. I send you a SIM, you send me an app, I sit there and ignore you, which means you keep that socket open and you do this about, oh, 65,000 times and then I run out of sockets and everything sucks. So even SIM floods can be relatively easily dealt with by mitigation strategies like SIM cookies where you send the act back with a particular sequence number and then you close the socket. And if you get the SIN act with a set followed se an appropriate sequence number, you can talk to that thing, but you don't have to sit there with sockets open until it speaks to you again. So, obviously, we get a little smarter. And at this point, malformed packets were the next approach. So who here has heard of the ping of death? Pretty much everybody. This is, in my opinion, one of the first forms of fuzzing. Take a packet, turn all the flags on, throw it in a box, see what the box does. Got wind nuke, you've got the teardrop attack. There's a variety of different attacks in this vein. And again, there's some pretty simple mitigation. You can basically say, okay, I expect a packet to look like this. If the packet doesn't look like this, then we're gonna drop it on the floor because it's clearly malicious. But again, uh, firewalls had to get smarter, routers had to get smarter, etc. More better mouse traps. So then we say, okay, well, you're discarding my traffic that you don't want, you're discarding my traffic if it doesn't look right. What if I send you traffic that looks right and I start to launch starvation attacks? And so these can be things like HTTP post attacks where I start a post and then I send you one packet at a time. And so you can hold a socket open and there is legitimate traffic going back and forth on that socket, it's just going back and forth so slowly but again, you can starve out the resources on the system. Post is one form of this. The slow read attacks are another form of this. These are actually a lot harder to counter because unless you're intelligently interrogating the web server, it's really hard to tell a slow read or a post attack from legitimate web traffic. So all of these so far are basically one box talking to one other box. Then you start to get into the issue of reflection attacks. And reflection attacks are where you start to leverage the fact that the internet is in fact multiple connected nodes and more of them can talk to each other at once. So the Smurf attack was one of the first good examples of this. And a Smurf attack was a basic reflection attack. I'm gonna send you a packet with a spoofed address, source address of your broadcast address. And so you're gonna then talk to everything in your environment. The idea there was to cause congestion in that environment. And we go from reflection attacks to amplification attacks, which is, as Dan illustrated, 
One of the good examples of this is DNS amplification. So this is really not useful unless I have a small army of attackers. DNS amplification or NTP amplification, the idea here is A, I want to send a relatively small amount of traffic and then generate a large amount of traffic towards the thing that I'm attacking. And B, I want to repeat this a gajillion times until everything in between us spills up and everything falls over. So for example, you could send spoofed packets with the source address of your victim to poorly configured DNS servers with zone transfer requests. Small request, giant payload, everything gets dumped on your victim. In order to do this though, it's really more effective if you can do a lot of things doing it at once. And this is where you really start to get into botnets. Compromised systems that have been infected by a worm or virus that are controlled by some central point, a bot herder, who is basically launching these attacks across all of these infected systems. And this can be lucrative and it can be expensive and it can be 300 gigabits worth of data incoming to your web server or whatever the resource is that they're trying to attack. So Iron Networks has a really interesting infrastructure known as Atlas. And they have relationships with something like 200 and some odd service providers that allow them to gather flow data, sampling flow data from these service providers to identify attacks around the world. So this is from uh, Q2 2014. They had a 155 gigabit attack. The peak that they saw was back in, I think, late January, these 300 gigabit DOS attacks, di distributed denial service attacks. So, <coughs> this mic is nuts. One of the biggest reasons that people launch these is profit. It's always follow the money, right? If you are a bot herder, you can sell this shit. So Juniper did a study, sort of a survey of what the going rate is on the open market. You can buy one hour of a denial of service attack for five bucks you can buy a month for $900. So if somebody really pisses you off and you want to take them offline, you just drop a grand and they're gone. That's one way to profit. Here's the other one. Extortion. It's the day before the Super Bowl. You're a betting site. You'd probably like to be online for the Super Bowl. If you pay me 20 grand, I won't knock you offline. So one of the challenges there is how do you know that they're going to keep their word? You could pay the 20 grand and still get knocked offline. But you know, if you're standing to make several million dollars, 20 grand to make somebody go away might not be that much. Another motivation behind these distributed denial of service attacks is to create a smokescreen. So one of the studies that was done indicated that 55% of companies that were attacked with a distributed denial of service attack also had theft of data at the same time. If all of your admins are over there dealing with your full pipes, they may not be noticing that somebody has backdoored your server and is quietly sucking data out of it. And by the way, I have a bunch of uh, resource links in the presentation. I've got, I'll have my email address at the end, so if you're interested in any of the sources for these statistics that I'm so casually throwing around, Feel free to email me and I can shoot you a copy of the deck. And of course, there are people who aren't in it for the money, they're in it for the lulls. So distributed denial of service is one of the favorite tools of internet activists such as Anonymous and LulzSec, etc. You see that on both sides of the fence. So there's a gentleman, and I use that term broadly, a jester, who has been using a tool that he built. I think he calls it Xerxes that he claims that he can take a single CDMA cell phone and launch attacks that will take down entire websites. And he launches this against jihadi sites and also against the Westboro Baptist Church. I'm kind of in favor of this myself. <laughs> That's where it really starts to get interesting because if you buy the argument that PayPal denying service or that PayPal, Visa, and MasterCard denying service to WikiLeaks is an invalid restraint of trade and a denial of service attack against WikiLeaks itself, then it's not a big step to see the logic behind Operation PayPal, where a lot of the targeted denial of service attacks, the low orbit ion cannon, which we'll get to in a minute, 
there was a coordinated attack against PayPal. This has been one of the most interesting of the attacks because of the criminal consequences and the social issues that it brings up. A little more on that in a minute. So the basic history of denial of service attacks, 25 years in one slide. 1989 was when the Dash F flag was added to ping. The Panix was the first ISP that was really broadly affected by a denial of service attack in 1996. 97 saw the Try New Attack Toolkit, which was the first simple toolkit for launching a denial of service attack from the comfort and privacy of your own home. Unsurprisingly, by 1999, the mainstream media caught on to this, and so USA Today had a feature article on it, and suddenly everybody was going, mm -hmm. And in 2000, we saw Mafia Boy. Mafia Boy became sort of the face of denial of service attacks. He's a 15-year-old kid who, with a computer in his basement, took down Yahoo. And this was the point where the public realized, you know, you don't have to have any particular skills. You run a program that you downloaded, push a button on your computer, and Yahoo goes away. It's a little concerning. So 2001 saw the first escalation from megabits to gigabits, a three gigabit DOS attack. And then the MyDoom worm was one of the first broad scale infections where the payload was a denial of service initially against SCO, but then later on also against Microsoft itself. So they couldn't decide which side of the fence they were on. Most of this is still people, you know, fart around their basement. And then you start to see it getting monetized. In 2004, we saw denial of service attacks against payment systems, authorize it and check out. And these were some of the first attacks that were directly linked to extortion attempts. Same with 2005 against the German gambling site Jack.de, where they had again the extortion attempt of pay us or we take you offline. So we've gone from, hey, look what I can do, to, hey, look what I can get money for doing, to, hey, I have a political opinion and you don't. So Michelle Malkin was a blogger who, in 2006, uh, you remember the cartoons of the uh, Prophet Muhammad that were considered offensive by a large religious community? They were trying to get them removed from the net. And so Michelle Malkin was the leader of a group of bloggers who were trying to make sure that they stayed on the internet. And a denial of service attack was launched against her so effectively that she had to uh, blog from other sites for several months until she could get her own site back online. So now that politics enters the mix, the next thing behind it is governments. State-sponsored attacks in Estonia to the point where the Estonians basically disconnected themselves from the internet for a while. Uh, so Anonymous starts to enter the picture in 2008, and initially they targeted Scientology. So we've gone from politics to religion and back, or from religion to politics and back. And then the Independence Day cyber attacks in 2009 were a broad scale set of distributed denial of service attacks against financial industries. So that sets the stage for Operation Payback in 2010. Initially, Operation Payback was not targeted at Visa or MasterCard or PayPal. It was targeted against the RIAA, the MPAA, organizations that Anonymous felt was unfairly keeping people from sharing uh, information that they felt should be free. And then you see LulzSec the rise of LulzSec in 2011, where they were able to take the CIA offline briefly, the CIA.gov website offline briefly. And so, you know, all this time, these tools and packages have been continuing to evolve. And so the It's Ono Problem Bro, which I just threw in there because I like the name. And, and finally, we're up to the point in 2013 where we have 300 gigabit attacks and no end in sight. So these attack toolkits are pretty simple. This is the Spike Toolkit. It's used to control uh, botnets to launch distributed denial of service attacks. It's obviously of Chinese origin. You've got the Slow Loris Toolkit, and this is the low bandwidth form of the attack. So this is the evolution of the HTTP POST attack, the slow read attacks, where you do a starvation attack against your victim. And then you also have my personal favorite, the Low Orbit Ion Cannon. I'm a charging my laser. And so this is the tool of choice for disaffected 15-year-olds in basements everywhere, basically. This is what is used in these coordinated attacks by Anonymous and LulzSec. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's an enormous amount of different toolkits and different options out there. So how do you defend against this? With all of these different motivations and all of these different tools, what can we actually do? 
If you're a small company, or if you don't have the infrastructure to defend yourself, obviously the first step is to get someone to defend you. So a lot of the large CDN, the content delivery networks, have had to build distributed denial of service protection into their environments. And they can do this because they have connectivity in multiple locations, multiple ingress and egress points. They can spread the attack out. They can you know, distribute it across their environment so it doesn't cripple their environment. They can also do the kind of volumetric flood detection and flood prevention. So Cloudflare offers this. Akamai offers this. Basically, if it's a large CDN, they have some solution for this. But what if you're not in the cloud? You know, what if you need to protect your own resources? You can farm it out to somebody like Verizon, who has managed service for uh, denial of service attack defense. Or you can look at individual tools like Gradware. Um, I think they're one of the sponsors today. So they have a tool that does basically scrubbing. They're, they have an appliance solution that will allow you to do attack scrubbing. Arbor Networks is one of the big ones. And they've got, in addition to their Atlas environment, they've got the peak flow solutions that allow you to do sampling, figure out where this traffic is coming from. So some of this is signature-based, some of this is volume-based. And then you have options like the Juniper DDoS Secure offering, which is heuristics-based, where if you're looking at traffic, this is where you actually start to be able to deal with some of the slow read, the HTTP post attacks, where you can actually look at the heuristics of the traffic and say a normal web session is fairly simple. My web browser sends you a request, you send me a large chunk of data in response, or several large chunks, HTTP 1.1. Then you click, I click on something and you send me more data. And so this has a pretty re reasonable cadence, a recognizable cadence, whereas some of these starvation attacks are gonna look nothing like that. So you can do heuristics against the traffic. And this really helps you deal with environments, as Dan was talking about earlier with Net, where you've got a gazillion devices behind one IP address. You can block the wrong IP address and knock an entire country off of your web server. So if you need to be able to commit legitimate traffic, but deny only malicious traffic, then you need a little more intelligence than simple IP-based blocking, or even signature-based. So those are all technology-based approaches to addressing distributed denial of service. The area that I think is the most interesting these days is layer eight, actually. So the politics layer is where there's not a lot of conversation. We all tend to be technologists. We want a solution that we can type into a command line. Unfortunately, there are other people who want other kinds of solutions, and then these may be imposed on us if we aren't aware and participating in the conversation. So one approach to distributed denial of service attacks, at least to attacks based on hacktivism, is the Richard Stallman approach, which is that these are a form of civil disobedience not unlike a sit-in at a lunch counter. So in North Carolina, in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, if, if there was a sit-in at a lunch counter, that business owner was losing business. It was a denial of service attack against that business because their seats, their finite number of seats were being occupied by people who were not paying for service. And so that analogy is being brought forward, you know, 30 years, 40 years, to say they did not harm the website in any way. All they did was block access to the website in the same way that you can have in a sit-in in, in the, the physical world. It's also very often accompanying this claim about civil disobedience is that distributed denial of service attacks for this purpose are free speech, that they are exercising a right of free speech. Clearly, that's not the only perspective. The other side of that coin is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which basically has both civil and criminal penalties for any unauthorized access to a system. And so the application here is to say that because the people executing these attacks are not consuming a resource in the way that the company intended, that that's an unauthorized access. So this is not unlike the argument that was made against Weave, against Andrew Arnheimer, that's you know, saying, well, okay, so AT&T put that information out there, made it freely available, and it was entirely possible for him to increment the integer at the end of that URL, but they didn't intend for him to do that, so it was an unauthorized access. 
And to me, I think that's an extremely slippery slope. I think that's a dangerous precedent for anyone who does scanning. I think it's a dangerous precedent for security researchers. And I'll be damned if I think it's fair for a business to say, we didn't do the work to secure our systems, so we're just gonna throw the book at you because you exploited the vulnerability. And we're totally off the hook in this. So one of the test cases for the tension between the free speech civil disobedience approach to activist distributed denial of service versus the criminal penalties in the CFAA is the PayPal 14 case. And in the PayPal 14 case, law enforcement was actually able to directly and unambiguously identify 14 of the you know, uncounted people who participated in Operation Payback. And so they were charged with, if I remember this correctly, they were charged with misdemeanor computer trespass and felony conspiracy. And that's one of the typical approaches to prosecutions under the CFAA, is to stack different charges to include each incident as an individual charge or to pile up the consequences as in the Aaron Schwartz case so that he was facing 35 years in jail for downloading documents that were freely accessible from MIT's network because the argument was that he was not authorized to download them at the rate that he was downloading them from the MIT network, even though it was open to all access. So this court case went through, and what ended up happening was that the 13 of the 14 people who were charged took a plea deal and it was taken down to misdemeanor computer trespass, basically. And they received probation and had some restitution to pay. But their lawyer, Stanley Cohen, made the same argument in their defense that Richard Stallman had made, that this is a, a virtual act of civil disobedience. And it's interesting because uh, Per Omidyar, who is the head of eBay, actually filed a brief requesting leniency in the case. So there have been a lot of conversations about different ways to address in the legal and technical, sort of political technical framework, the problem of distributed denial of service attack or denial of service attack at all. One of the zombie methods, and I say that because it keeps coming up and getting shot down over and over again, is the idea of a driver's license to use the internet. Unsurprisingly, this seems to keep coming from Microsoft. Microsoft has all the right ideas. So this is back in 2010. And they were basically saying that you should not be able to send any packet on the net that is not traceable back to an identifiable source. I don't know about you, I don't like that idea. I think that there are good and valid uses for anonymity on the internet. And I'm unwilling to throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we can't come up with as technologies, a better solution to distributed denial of service attacks than destroying anonymity on the internet, we have failed. Another bright idea from Microsoft, this one about the same time frame, Scott Charney, I was actually at the RSA where he gave this keynote and he proposed that you just shouldn't be allowed to get on the internet if your computer was infected. So his plan was something vague along the lines of service providers being able to identify infected systems and deny them access to the broader internet and only allow them access to you know, large antivirus vendors, large patch vendors, et cetera. Yes? Because NAC never has any false positives. Oh, oh, yeah, because antivirus never has any false positives, absolutely. And one of the, one of the challenges I see, of the, of the myriad challenges I see with this approach and leaving out even the technical challenges of who gets to define what's infected if you build a system like this, there is no guarantee that it will only be used for the purposes it's originally intended. So if you were in my talk yesterday, this is gonna sound familiar. Who gets to be the gatekeeper? You've now built a system that can decide whether every node can connect to the internet. Who gets to control that system? And who gets to decide what the access control policies are? Today, it's infected systems. What is it tomorrow? The sort of reductio ad absurdum of that approach is Cory Doctorow 
I really strongly recommend either watching his speech to the CCC or reading this article. He's been warning of a war on general purpose computing. So when the first personal computers came out, you could run anything you wanted to on them. We had an Apple II Plus, and one of my first experience with computers was playing pirated games on an Apple II Plus in my basement at, you know, 12. So probably 10, actually. Um, we, and I, my father was the one who was doing the cracking. I was no, nowhere near intelligent <laughs> enough to be doing it at that point. Um, not saying that to, anyway, he's saying I'm not, I wasn't that much of a wizard at 10, not claiming to be. His point is general purpose computing has been slowly whittled away over the past decades, and it's been done with almost no discussion. So how many of you have had the experience of trying to play a DVD or a game or a movie, piece of entertainment on your PC and not being able to play it because of DRM. Pretty much everyone in the room at this point. That is the face of the war on general purpose computing. Because again, today we can't play protected content. Tomorrow, maybe we can't send unauthorized packets. Who gets to decide what's an unauthorized packet? And we have the shift from desktop systems, desktop operating systems, which start with the assumption that the operating system is open and locking mechanisms have to be bolted on afterwards. But I don't know about you, I read 75% of my email on my phone these days. I probably do 90% of my web surfing. Is there anyone in here who, in either your work or personal life, has basically abandoned the desktop OS for your tablet or your phone? Like, one. It's coming. The tablets are getting bigger, they're getting smarter, they're getting more usable. I'm almost to the point where I could stop carrying a laptop in my day-to-day -day professional job. And the problem with that is we have silently ceded control in that shift from desktop OSs to handheld OSs. Apple being the absolute you know, pathological case of this, where you cannot run software on the compute device in your hand unless it is approved by Apple. At least with Android, you can usually, in most cases, root the device, sideload, etc. But we're moving from a world where general purpose computing is the norm to a world where it's the exception. And the question is, do we want that? Will that, should, that would solve the problem of distributed denial of service attacks. If you cannot run the low orbit ion cannon, then you can't attack that way. It would probably not solve all attacks because there are still things like the DNS amplification attacks, or it'd be really hard to detect that you're launching you know, that kind of attack from your system. But these detection methods are getting smarter and smarter. So the question is, is this a problem that we want to solve at layer three, layer four, layer seven, or layer eight? Because if we don't talk about these things, other people will solve them for us. So that's what I have today. Questions, comments, mystic chants, interpretive dance? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Always count on you. I'll yeah. just make one comment that... Uh... Here, actually, let me give you the mic because it's recorded. Yeah, I'll just make the comment that, um, from my perspective, uh, Ragnar has been seeing that most of these attacks don't come in just one flavor. We see five to seven different types of attacks going on at the same time at the same target. Um, you see the vol volumetric spike and think you have the attack nailed down, and then there's five or six other things for you to deal with. Makes sense. Yeah, One thing that I noticed in the news lately is that they started talking about how uh, DOS attacks are now getting in the realm of cyber war and in real war, you know, in the Russia versus Ukraine uh, war, uh, Russia uh, DOS a bunch of Ukraine's communications infrastructure. So we got to think about cyber war now when talking about DOS, don't we? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's the layer eight aspect for sure. What do we do short term? What do you think we 
should do long term for the use of cloud services as sources of uh, attacks? That's an interesting question. I try to ask interesting. <laughs> I don't have a good answer. Does anyone else in the audience have a thought on that? And I think that there should be some responsibility on a cloud service provider to filter outbound traffic. They're, they're taking out, we're making profit. Yeah. As long as they're making profit, they don't care. <laughs> Follow the money, right? And the question is who's going to impose that responsibility on them? How do they differentiate? Yeah, as, as you said, how do they differentiate uh, you know, a, a, an attack from valid traffic? Because a lot of the, a lot of the attacks look like valid traffic. Technology isn't to a point where we can absolutely say with certainty whether one particular packet is part of an attack or not. The volumetric flood detection, different types of attack detection are getting smarter, but until we can do that, would you want your traffic blocked because of a cloud service provider? One, one other thing, uh, sometimes these cloud service providers, I noticed they don't care what they're protecting. I mean, like for example, Cloudflare is protect, Last time I checked, they're protecting the rescator.cc carding uh, market. Last time I checked. I'm actually completely in favor of that because I would hate to have them be the gatekeeper of what is acceptable to protect and what is not. In regards to... <laughs> in regards to uh, you know, the outbound traffic, there there is some uh, not already uh, things that are working for that, but uh, I know like uh, Netflix. I think, uh, faster. <laughs> if it wasn't broken, it's broken now. <laughs> um, where the the ISP not the ISPs for home infrastructure, but like the, the backbone, they have peering agreements. And so if they send about the same amount of traffic, they say, let's we'll call it even, but one send more. Yeah, so the backbone ISPs have peering agreements. So if they're sending roughly the equivalent amount of traffic, then it doesn't cost either side. But if they're, if one side is much higher than the other, then there are charges incurred. So the backbone ISPs have some skin in the game to be reducing the amount of crap traffic that flows over the networks because eventually it will hit their bottom line and that's where they get involved. I saw hands. One of the things that I think we also need to be cognizant of is you were talking about how manufacturers have silently set it so that they control what software you can run and they control what you can do uh, with a general purpose, ostensibly general purpose system. The government is now being complicit in that and trying to do propaganda, and hopefully I won't get any on, on any list for this, but the head of the FBI, even in contradiction to what the manufacturers are doing, is pushing for more control to say that uh, the head of the FBI's, I forget his name, the uh, comparison the other day saying that cryptography on iOS 8 will help pedophiles. And yeah, okay, maybe it will, but it'll help the rest of us too, and I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, like you said. The think of the children argument, it gets pulled out when you don't have a good technical argument. And as I said yesterday also, if you build a back door, there's no guarantee you're going to be the only one walking through it. So, anybody else? Okay. Working my way back there. On Hang on. Back door. If, if, the, if the government, if, if you know your government is influencing... Is that working? All right, if you know your government is influencing uh, commercial ventures, then you know that there's a higher probability of a backdoor. If I'm a hacker and I'm spending 17 hours on trying to get a backdoor and I don't come up with anything, maybe I quit. But if I know there's a backdoor there, then I'm willing to spend three weeks cloud computing, throw everything at it until I find it. People get a lot more highly motivated. That's a great point. Anybody else? I don't need a microphone. Go. No, I don't. Go. So really, I was one the, the thing you said about civil disobedience uh, really struck a chord with me because 
there is some validity to that argument that in some circumstances you might have a valid reason to say, no, this is too much, like when the government tries to take away our rights. But you can also say it's civil disobedience when Gamergate starts harassing someone because they're expressing their opinion. From their point of view, I'm not saying it's valid, because I don't think it is, but from their point of view, they're being civil disobedient. From my point of view, they're being insane. So Jeff's point is that the point about civil disobedience cuts both ways, that you can claim that it's civil disobedience when Operation <coughs> Payback is launched against PayPal, but in Gamergate, when people are harassing individuals, they're also claiming free speech. And you, you have to embrace the bad aspects of free speech along with the good aspects of free speech. You know, Weed is a great example of that. I would not say that I stand for anything that he does except that it should not be illegal to increment integers in a URL. Everything else about him I find abhorrent, but I donated to the uh, legal defense because of the precedent that was set. So I think we have time for one more. Just comment on civil dis disobedience. Remember in the example you gave at the start of it, people were willing to go to jail for the cause, and I think that's one of the things you gotta remember is that that's part of the game. If you're gonna play that card, you're gonna be willing to go to jail. Yeah, the comment on civil disobedience, people have to be willing to go to jail for the cause. If you are going to play that game in the realm of civil disobedience, then you have to be willing to go to jail if you lose. So thank you guys. Have a great afternoon.